All right, it's eight o'clock, meaning it's time for opening ceremony to start. So welcome everybody to the closing ceremony of the International Youth Brainstorm Summit. It's incredible having you here today. And thank you for joining us for our closing ceremony. So we are currently live on YouTube and to do a pre brief overview of what we're going to cover today. Today, we're just going to have some opening remarks for the closing ceremony, a few thank yous. And then we're going to have a keynote speech from Dr. Rose before we go into our awards. So stick around and we're really excited to see you here. So welcome to the closing ceremony. This is hosted by Simply Neuroscience and the International Youth Neuroscience Association. I know you've heard a lot from our organizers already, so great to see you again. And throughout the course of the competition, we received over 120 eligible team project submissions from over 600 participants in 42 countries, all over the course of 72 hours of innovation. So thank you so much for just sitting at our competition and making all of this possible. So for our quick icebreaker, we'd like you to type your response in the Zoom or the YouTube live chat. What was your favorite part about participating in this competition? Was it working with your teammates? Was it exploring a new field of neuroscience that you never thought about before? Was it attending our speaker session? Uh, like, it's, it's like, wait, I feel like that was encourage people to not really look at the pieces we've given them like, as seriously and then spend a lot of time outside of outside of this and maybe not buy anything food for just get more frustrated with themselves. And I feel like they might just end up hurting themselves if they give them that choice. I think we should keep it between our scripts too. Yeah, that's awesome. I see a lot of really cool responses as well in the chat. So meeting my bomb team, connecting with people from all over the world, exploring a new field of neuroscience, presenting, even though I know some people were mentioning that that would be very stressful, but I know people also mentioned that it was actually kind of chill working with their friends because they had great ideas. Skylar said, roasting the Android users at my UI workshop, presenting innovative solutions, working with an amazing team, friendships from all around the world, exploring new concepts in neuroscience. Many people were mentioning creating new friendships and making, just really connecting with everybody. So I'm and really we glad we picked them out and we've been doing inter. <laughs> but then, yeah. So thank you so much for letting us know your responses uh, and for being so supportive. All oh, that's great. So we really are glad that you enjoyed your experience in the competition, even while working virtually, as Iman mentioned, and being a part of this community. And it's really incredible that we've only been here for about three days and you guys have gotten so much out of it. So thank you for that. So thank you. We also wanted to say thank you to our sponsors and supporters which are the New Academy of Sciences, Texas Instruments, The Art of Problem Solving, and Circuit Mule. All of them will be providing prizes for our winners, which will be announced later in the ceremony. And this definitely could not have been possible without any of our judges. We have over 30 judges. A special shout out to Dr. Caroline Johnson, Mr. Segar Chaturvedi, and Dr. Vanchika Sain Singh. <laughs> I'm sorry, for being our expert judges today for judging the top 10 presentations. I hope some of you guys were able to watch those and enjoyed it. And a huge shout out to our workshop hosts. That would be Jacob for discussing his research experiences and how to make the most of a research experience. Science Communication by Adrian. Finding and securing STEM workshops in high school with Shivali from Go Genius, and our organizing team member Skylar for her graphic design and Figma UI prototyping workshop, which I know some of you guys actually used to build apps for your final project submissions, and that was incredible to see. So, without further ado, we're going to pass it on to Aravin to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Raja Knowles. Thanks, Athena. When we began planning the International Youth Brainstorm Summit just a few short weeks ago, None of us would have imagined the extent to which this competition would grow. In just a few short weeks, we had over 600 participants sign up from around the world. We prepared all the logistics and prompts, recruited 30 highly qualified judges who are experts in each of their disciplines of neuroscience. But none of this would have been possible without all of you. We thank each and every one of the judges, the speakers, the participants, and everyone who is involved in this competition. Now, to headline our closing ceremony will be the renowned neuroscientist, Dr. Roger Knowles. Professor Roger Knowles took an unusual route to becoming Drew's neurobiologist and expert in Alzheimer's disease research. 
After graduating from West Point in 1986 and majoring in human factors, he served as a lieutenant in the United States Army. With the ending of the Cold War, he left the Army and went to Harvard University, where he earned a PhD in neuroscience in 1996. After two years as a research fellow at the Alzheimer's Research Center at Massachusetts General Hospital, he joined the Department of Biology at Drew University in 1998 and spearheaded the drive to develop a neuroscience major at Drew. During his time at Drew, Professor Roger Knowles has served as the director of the neuroscience program, chair of the biology department, and chair of the health professions committee. He has successfully written 15 grants, published 38 manuscripts and abstracts, mentored 50 undergraduate honors theses, and developed and taught 14 different undergraduate neuroscience courses. One of the highlights of his career was a successful Howard Hughes Medical Institute program grant, which he directed for five years and which helped create more research opportunities for Drew undergraduates. I would now like to welcome Dr. Roger Knowles, your closing keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, that wonderful introduction. And uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to be here and was selected to be the keynote speaker for this event. This is the type of thing that I'm, um, I'm really thrilled about that's taken off, this idea that the people across the globe are interested in uh, projects and learning more about how to interact with each other to try to push forward our knowledge and science. It's a great thing. And I really, really applaud the organizers. I think this is a great thing that you guys have done and that all the participants really a shout out to, uh, to you for, for being engaged in this, this topic. So today, what I was going to do is uh, tell you a few, few comments about my, my path to becoming a neuroscientist, uh, just a little bit. And then I'd like to uh, share a few of the, um, the recent research experiences that my, my students have had while, while I've been working at uh, Drew University the last few years. So right now, it's, um, it's a little after 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, New Jersey. I know people are across the world, different time zones. For me, my, um, my family just, uh, you know, they're, they're just getting ready to, to have dessert. Um, and so I had to leave the, the dinner table to come up here to, to go, do this presentation. But don't worry. I, I, actually, I don't have a sweet tooth. Um, ice cream, cake, brownies, cupcakes, all those things. None of it does anything for me. Um, I'm not a weirdo. Like, I don't have some special diet. I don't really care about, um, you know, the calories coming in. I'm, I'm fine with all that. I just, I just don't really have a sweet tooth. Um, and, you know, that's just the way I, way I roll. But it turns out that I became a research scientist in studying Alzheimer's disease partly because of a oatmeal raisin cookie. Weird, huh? Someone who doesn't have a sweet tooth became a neuroscientist and studied Alzheimer's because of an oatmeal raisin cookie. How did, how did that happen? Well, um, I want you to get in the time machine, go back decades, decades, to when I was 18 years old, plus minus the age that many of you are around right now, starting college for the first time. Uh, I went to a college uh, like many of you either are planning to or doing so now or just finishing up. Um, but the college I went to was West Point. Um, it's an unusual college in the sense that it's a, it's a military academy so that the graduates from that college um, go on and serve in the United States Army for four to five years, depending upon their commitment. And, you know, when I, when I got there um, as a freshman, uh, I did all the, I did what everyone else did in the freshman. I wore a uniform to class. I marched around. I saluted everyone who was my superior, which when you're a freshman, or they actually called you plebes back then, uh, was everyone. So, so I, I, was, I was going around just doing the regular army thing and taking classes, chemistry, calculus, um, computer science, history, political science history, all, 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 the, all the variety of different things out there. And, um, but we had to follow rules, um, a lot of rules, right? So there was rules about how we'd walk to class. There was rules about how we would dress. There were these rules about how we'd groom ourselves. There's even rules about how we lined our shoes under our bed. A lot of rules, I, just, a, just a weird, weird way to live your life. Um, but there was one rule that the freshmen universally loved which was that they were allowed to put one box in their room that they could put any goodies that they got from home. So if your mom and dad or your grandparents, they would bake you cookies or treats and send you things, you could put in that box. And at night, when the upperclassmen would tend to, you know, let you study, let your hair down. Well, we, can, we really couldn't let our hair down because we didn't have much hair back then. We had to keep our hair cut. It didn't matter. Um, we, we were just able to relax and you know, uh, take, take out things from our little, uh, our little boxes of, of goodies. Um, 
turns out my, my, my parents weren't, neither of them were, were bakers. I, I really didn't have very much in, in that frame, but it didn't bother me because again, I, I really don't have a sweet tooth. I had a friend freshman year, uh, his, his name was Chris, and Chris was a typical college student who from time to time would struggle with various subjects. And, and I, I would say math was his biggest struggle and we all had to take calculus as all part of our, our freshman deal. So I'd go and, and I would, um, I would you know, try to help him with, with his calculus. And, um, and Chris, Chris grew up about an hour north of, of West Point up in upstate New York and came from a large family, like seven brothers and sisters, a big extended family and, and the matriarch of the family, his grandmother, you know, lorded and shepherd over them all. And Chris was the apple in her eye. She, he was the one who she just was so, so proud of and, and, um, and, and really cared deeply for him. And when, when growing up, Chris would tell me the story that, you know, she would always show up to you know, their house bringing treats, right? And one of the treats she always brought were these oatmeal raisin cookies. It turns out no one in his family liked these oatmeal raisin cookies. The brothers and sisters never would take a, a bite out of, out of them. But Chris, being incredibly polite, he would go and he could take a few and, and, and eat a few and, 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 and show that, that, he, that he cared about his grandmother by, by, by sharing in this little treat that she made for him. But she got in her head that he absolutely loved these and kept making more and more of these oatmeal rings and cookies. So he had a, uh, a dog. Um, it was a great day. He's big, huge dogs. Uh, they're so tall that, that like, when they're sitting down, their head is above the dining room table. And so he, he learned this trick where he would take the cookies and feed the dog who happened to be named Samson. Actually, I think there's some rule that all great Danes have to be named something like Samson or Goliath or whatever. But anyways, he would, he would feed his dog these oatmeal raisin cookies. And and his, his grandmother never knew. She thought that he absolutely loved those. So fast forward to West Point, she's sending him every week, you know, incredible desserts, apple strudel, these incredible brownies, fudge. And every time she sent something, she also sent his favorite dessert, the oatmeal raisin cookies. But of course, Chris didn't like the oatmeal raisin cookies. So one day I was in, one night I was in his, uh, his room and we were going over, I think, intervals. And, uh, you know, his mind was not in it. He was losing focus. So he reached under his bed to his box and he pulled out to get a treat. And there was nothing left except for the oatmeal raisin cookies. So he got this kind of gleam in his eye. And he looked at me. He said, Roger, would you like to try a cookie? I picked it up. I tried it. And why his family didn't like it, I could tell because it really wasn't that sweet. But for me, it was just perfect. It was like the type of food that I liked. And so I ate one, and then a second, and then a third. And before long, a pattern developed where Chris, instead of throwing away the cookies, which he hated to do because he hated even the thought of his grandmother's cookies going to waste, started feeding me the oatmeal raisin cookies for helping him with his calculus. Um, in a way, right, if you've been paying attention, I kind of took the role of Samson, the, the Great Dane, there, there's imagery for you, right? <laughs> Just kind of weird. Um, but anyways, I, I, I took, I took the, on, on that role and I, you know, we were good friends and we were good friends for four years. So fast, fast forward four years down the road. So college is ending. Um, you know, during the summers, we would do our GI Joe stuff. You know, I'd learn to put camo on my face and low crawl in the mud and shoot a rifle and drive a tank and jump out of, I actually jumped out of airplanes, you know, all that stuff I did, right? And um, because I was part of the army training, but that all pretty much happened during, during the summer. And during the academic year, we took classes like everyone else took classes. Um, and then I um, were getting close to graduation and it was a week before, and Chris invited me um, to his house for a weekend, uh, family get together, you know, celebrating several different things, but including you know, his, his mind soon to be graduation. My parents haven't come up yet, um, so I saw it a couple of days before they arrived. So this is great chance to get out of the, out of, out of, uh, the institution and and um, and relax a little bit. So I went up, and also part of me, because I never actually had met his grandmother, and part of me I, I wanted to go to her and tell her, and be like the first person to tell her that I really loved her oatmeal raisin cookies, and be authentic about it. Right, whereas I think Chris was a little deceptive on that front. Um, so. I arrived at his family's get together. Um, I drove up there, you know, a few minutes late, but I arrived, showed up, and 
I suddenly hear someone screaming and yelling. And I look over and I see this old woman and you are my jailer. She's yelling at a woman who I learned was later that Chris's aunt, you torture me every night. She yelled at a man who later found out was um, Chris's uncle. And Chris was just sitting next to her the whole time, just gently touching her arm, just petting her arm, just relaxing, just, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And then all of a sudden something went on, something in the synapses, something in the pathology. And suddenly that, that angry verbiage that came out stopped. The grace settled on her and she turned and she looked at Chris, probably not quite with recognition in her eyes, but, but she saw Chris who was kind to her, who was gentle to her. And she said, do you want a cookie? And I stood there. I'm like tears running down my cheeks. I, 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 this is my first time I've ever seen someone with Alzheimer's disease. Um, you're young. Um, you feel like, you know, the story about Alzheimer's disease has been around for a while. And, you know, Alice Alzheimer did his stuff back in the early 1900s. But growing up, Alzheimer's disease for us was a very rare condition. No one talked about it. It was something that people didn't refer to as a major disease. Um, and certainly we really didn't understand the full nature of how it was affecting our populations. So this was it. This is the first time I had that, that face-to-face and, and it struck me you know, to the core because this is someone who my friend had, who loved him. And I saw in her that the disease was not just a disease that was affecting her body, but it was affecting her mind and her brain. And I, I, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a few days away from graduating. I finished my last final exam. I don't even have, I hadn't even taken a biology class. I'd taken chemistry and physics and my, my honor thesis, if you want to call it an honor thesis, at the West Point version of it. I did a, um, a project where I, I um, did a pro- team project. We redesigned inside of a tank to be more ergonomically accessible to humans, right? So we work to engineer the controls and the devices based on human body and human reactions. I mean, by the time that that project was over, I was dead set that, you know, there's no chance that I was going to become an engineer. Like I, I was bored out of my mind by, by this particular project, but, but I had taken all this, but I, but I never taken biology. I didn't have a neuroscience class. I didn't, I mean, no one taught neuroscience back then in, in, in the eighties. Um, and I was getting ready to go off and serve during the time of the cold war. I was going to be stationed in a unit in what was then West Germany. I don't know if there's any Germans out there now, but um, it was a um, it was a town uh, near the Moselle River. Uh, so um, it's a town called Peterswald, Han Air Base. And I was going to be stationed there for a few years, and so I had to make a decision about what to do about it, right? And so one one decision is when you're faced with a challenge, you say, "Well, I'm not ready for this. I was so far from being ready for it. I had nothing." I had no biology, I had no nurse, I had nothing. How can I be involved with the study of Alzheimer's disease? So I thought about it, right? And I did my, my GI Joe stuff and I did the, you know, lieutenant in the army, I had my soldiers, I did all my different jobs. But in the back of my mind, I thought when this is over, when I get my chance to get free, may, maybe let me think about what I wanna do. So I start taking night classes, correspondence classes. This is back before the internet, I, I'd write letters back to, um, um, program directors at neuroscience programs describing who I am and what I was and like, what do you think about my chance of getting into your institution? What can I do to improve? And so I worked at it as best I could, you know, during that time period. And I was fortunate. The, um, I was in Germany when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. I did go to the wall at the time. There was actually uh, orders for um, the army, the U.S. Army, to stay away from the wall because they didn't want it to seem to be a U.S. thing. They wanted it to be a German thing, which was a wise, a wise call. But I was there during that time, and it was great to see. It was great to see the peace. It was great to see the change in society that was percolating. And in conversation throughout was this, you know, this hope that we'd find a way for peace. Uh, I took advantage of that. I was able to actually get a year off my service to uh, start my graduate program because they were so, they were so focused on maybe trying to downsize the army. I <laughs> started my program at, at Harvard uh, that fall. Uh, even before I arrived, 
to Boston. Um, Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait and the United States Army has basically been at war ever since in some fashion or form. So I got out on the, the peace dividend while, while it still existed at the end of the Cold War, but then, um, then I was in graduate school during, during all that time period. And, and all through that, it, it was good. I, I, I chose neuroscience as a field because I was drawn to the questions that was being asked by it. Um, but also the sense of, I wanted to you know, be someone who could try to make a difference in some way, right? I also found while I was doing it, you know, the, which path was right for me. Um, there's many paths for scientists to go into, whether it's industry, academia, government, um, consulting. There's lots and lots and lots of different ways, writing, uh, communications, lots of places where there's a huge need, innovators, um, all those things are really important. I found education to be my sweet spot. I found the idea that I could teach as well as do research was just the right setting for me. And so I looked around until I found a school like the university, which pushes forward the liberal arts with all of its breadth of, of knowledge, which kind of appealed to me, even though as a West Point Army person, you might think liberal arts would be a little bit foreign, but but actually it wasn't because it's the idea that getting this broad breadth really helps you because again, I graduated from college without even a single biology class. I'm starting or in the middle of my, my third term as a biology department chair at a university, right? You know, so it's kind of funny that I'm, that, I, that that's the path that I ended up. But the idea of, of finding and trying to look for how you can pursue science but also fit with your own strengths was really important for me. And, and, I, th and I think I was, I've been lucky uh, to find the truth. Okay. So what I like to do is to, uh, I have a good, so I've got a, a good another 25 minutes to go. I will um, go over and share my screen and I'm going to go through some PowerPoints with you from uh, some research students that I've had over the last couple of years. I'll share some of their stories, what they've done uh, with me while we've been working together in the research lab. Um, it's been a it's been a great um, opportunity for me. I'm usually my lab usually has any given semester or summer five to six research students who are working with me, undergraduates, and uh, it's been a, a great pleasure for mine to really help mentor them in any shape, fashion, or form. So I'm going to go and, and show you how we've gone about doing research in Alzheimer's disease in a small school, as opposed to where I was trained at Harvard, National Hospital, where the resources that we had were astronomical, right? Everything at my fingertips at, at that point. Here, you know, more of my projects are the art of the possible, learning how to craft and think about research with the tools that, and the resources that are, that are available and trying to find ways to help push forward our knowledge as best I can. Okay, so without further ado, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a look at, uh, uh, you know, two of the last three years of uh, students in my, my lab during the summertime group of kids that I've really enjoyed. Um, some of them started my lab as freshmen. Um, usually about half of them will end up doing an honors thesis at some level. They'll present at conferences or, or write out abstracts, um, be involved in, in, in papers that we can write. Uh, it's been always a lot of fun to, to work with the students. I'll try to tell you a little bit about them as we move forward and, and try to talk about the research that we've done. So for those that know a little bit about Alzheimer's disease, the, the two classic uh, lesions of the disease, the pathologies that most people think about are the, the plaques and the tangles. The plaques are these large extracellular lesions filled with this small molecule called amyloid beta that forms these, these oligomers and fibrils that then expand in and around the neurons and glial cells in the neuro pill. The tangles are uh, primarily a lesion inside of the cells. They develop inside of neurons. It's a molecule called tau protein, which becomes phosphorylated. Uh, actually just out um, recently has been an idea that, um, that this tau protein as the, as the phosphorylation comes inside a cell in this abnormal way, that the, the neurons try to expel it and it get washed out through the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid. And now there's evidence that scientists have found a test to be able to actually test whether in the blood there's this phosphorylated tau. And I'm excited to see whether or not uh, future research will show that this might end up being a decent blood test for the disease. But these lesions are difficult to understand. Um, first, how they form, but also their role in generating the 
the primary deficits that we see in the disease, which is neuronal damage. Um, Alzheimer's disease at its root is really about disrupting neurons communications. At its ultimate level, neurons, the damage leads to neuronal death where neurons are dying. Um, by the end of a disease, you may have lost upwards of 50% of the neurons inside of your brain. But even before that, there's striking evidence that the early stages of the disease are marked by a, a disruption in the actions between the synapses in neurons and leading to cascades that eventually lead to their, their damage. So when I was at Mass General Hospital doing my research at the Alzheimer's Research Center, I focus on the plaques and tangles primarily to understand, to try to understand the relationship between each other. However, when I transitioned to Drew, um, I didn't have the resources really available to explore those major pathologies. So instead I shifted a little bit into the thought of how they could potentially play a role in causing the neuronal damage that leads to the disruption in communication between the sets of cells and thereby leading to the, the deficits that we see in this horrific disease. So the method that I use with my students is one of primary neuronal cell culture. What we do is we sacrifice a pregnant rat, we take out the embryos and cut off their heads. I know that sounds pretty disgusting. I have to go back and remember, I'm the guy who doesn't like dessert, so just keep that in mind. Um, so we, we, we take off the heads of these, uh, these little embryos and the students will uh, dissect out the cortices, try to harvest the cortical tissue. And these are embryonic, they're like about three to four days prior to giving birth. We use this model system, um, again, because of the art of the possible. We can grow the cells that come from this. Uh, if I took the adult brain and tried to grow the cells, in the conditions I find myself in in my lab, very few, less than 1% would really live. So we work with embryonic cells because at that point, there's enough of them that are in the early stage of development that they can withstand this procedure where they're broken apart, disassociated in media, and then plated on plastic dishes with a little bit of a chemical coating to let them stick to the bottom. And what we see is that over a day, uh, or that you know, they start to grow, uh, start to showing some axons, and then this is a picture of them at one week um, in culture. And at one week, you can see uh, clearly the uh, differentiation of axons and dend dendrites, but just the starting points where they're starting to connect with each other. Um, and that really takes off over the next week. And so by two weeks in culture, you actually see these cells making lots and lots and lots of synapses. Um, so the, the dendritic arborization is really high, lots of presynaptic terminals, lots of neurotransmitter being released, lots of action potentials being fired, a whole bunch of neural activity occurring in this plate. But of course, they're not part of a network. They're just disassociated cells that have just come together. Um, so they're talking to each other, but there's no real information being processed, uh, no communication of, of meaning that's going on in these. But this state at two weeks, we think, and, and others, who I've worked with and collaborated in years past that have, have determined that the cells have reached a mature enough stage at two weeks with these lots of synapses that they now will mimic at least some of the characteristics of adult neurons. So as a model system, that, that's about the best that I, could, I can work with right now. Um, by the way, I use rats rather than mice. Some of you may have heard about a lot of mouse models out there, which are really fun to use. I use rats mainly because of the size. Um, I find my students have difficulty learning the procedure and with the small mouse brains, it's really hard to, to do those dissections. But with the rat brain at the stage, they're relatively big. They're, they're about the size of a pea, um, which I'm, I know it's not that big, but, but it's big enough for them with their, their forceps that they're able to, to do these dissections. So we let them grow and establish at that point. And then at that point, we start adding stressors that we may think might be part of the cascade that might be important for, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And so examples of ones that we'll talk about today in class, in today's, today's lecture, amyloid beta, which is the peptide that makes up the plaques, glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter, 
which is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, and NMDA, which is N-methyl diaspartate, which is a specific agonist to a specific type of glutamate receptor that we think that the amyloid beta may be having some particularly bad consequences on. So we plate these cells, and where we plate them usually are in these plates that have lots and lots of wells. And this example here is a 96 well plate, just shown here. And what we'll do is we'll usually have the inner 60 wells as part of our conditions, and we might you know, have a variety of different conditions, control one or two of the stressors, then some of the potential treatment strategies that we're thinking about, and then we'll, we'll mix and match them to try to come up with some ideas about what's going on um, in the disease pathway. The types of measurements we make, um, this is uh, two examples. I'll go through a third uh, a behavior one a little bit later when we talk about the animal models. But th these are two obvious ones. One is immunocytochemistry, where we would fix the cells at a particular time point, and we will look for their physical structure, right? We'll look at the appearance of their axons and dendrites. We'll try to ascertain their general health by the, by the morphology of the cells. Sometimes we'll look at specific proteins like that will be available at in synapses. Sometimes we'll look at um, the, uh, the proteins like that are involved with tau phosphorylation, trying to understand whether this signaling cascade is starting to maybe start generating the tangles in these cells. And then we'll compare them you know, between control and some stressor. And here's an example of a stressor where the, many of the cells survived, but the neurites degenerated. So it broke up the synapses, it broke up the axons and dendrites in these cells, they really retracted. And that gave some example of some of the degeneration that we expect to see. The other major assay that we do is a um, MTS assay. It's a assay that is, um, you know, one that we can use to give a uh, rough estimate of cell viability or slash survivability. So this is a dye that when we put onto our cells, it'll be converted by live cells into a brownish product. And so this brownish product can be read on a plate reader that reads the absorbance of that particular wavelength of light. And so you'll see some areas here where you see really dark um, wells. That means there's a lot of cells there. And then others you'll see particularly light cells where we suspect a lot of cells have died. And so we will use this and we can sort of calculate out the percentage of cells that survive compared to controls. And we can sort of get some sort of general sense of how our conditions are leading to affect the ultimate effect on these cells, which is their survival. So th this is my general experimental design in my lab. Um, it's not perfect. It's one of those designs where I'm using embryonic cells to study a disease of the aging. I can't reproduce plaques and tangles, the two major pathologies of the disease in my cultures. Yet I can try to find some of the pathways that we think are important and see whether or not there, makes, there seems to be some consensus about what's going on in the neurons and if there's something we can do to help protect them. Um, I just wanna say right here, you know, I mean, whatever the results might look like to you, I mean, nothing's worked so far. I mean, all of the phase three drug trials that have been out there, they've all failed. You know, the, um, the last time there was a successful phase three drug trial for Alzheimer's disease uh, was back in the early 2000s and it's for a drug that affects one of the glutamate receptors and the effects of, those, of that drug is relatively mild you know, on the disease pathway. So the first project I'm gonna talk about uh, came about with a collaboration I got had with a um, one of our scientists at Drew University, whose name was uh, Ron Dahl. And Ron um, is a member of our program called RISE. These are these recently retired industrial scientists who made a career working in labs like um, at Merck, Shearing Cloud, Novartis, big companies like that. Uh, really impressive scientists. In fact, one of the reasons I ended up choosing Drew to teach was because of our RISE program, because I knew the scientists there were so good, so strong, that I'd have people to work with and talk about you know, the different projects I was working on. Um, just to give you a sense of how strong they are, um, a few years ago, uh, 2015, one of the RISE fellows won the Nobel Prize in medicine for his uh, research while he was at, at Merck, but, but, he, but that was the level of scientist, a, a Nobel Prize winning scientist. Well, anyways, Ron was working with uh, another group and they were looking at 
synthesizing. And, and Ron's work, Ron Dahl's work, was he's mainly a synthetic chemist. And he was looking to synthesize new small molecules that could interact with this uh, receptor for glutamate called the MGLUR4 receptor. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but his project was with his students coming up with different variations on this small molecule that can potentially interact with this receptor, varying some of the bonds, varying some of the, um, the atoms that would be attached to it, and seeing whether or not they would have different effects you know, on these receptors. So then he collaborated with me and, and asked, you know, is there a project there that we can look at for Alzheimer's disease that would be there? And I had two students, uh, Lindsay and Eileen, who are excited about uh, you know, collaborating with that RISE lab. And so they, they took the, the chemicals that they synthesized and they came down to my lab and they tried to ascertain whether or not these could help protect the neurons from um, a neural, neural death pathway. So let me just give you a brief overview of glutamate. So it's the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. It interacts, um, interactions between uh, glutamate signaling and amyloid beta may contribute to the disease pathway. Um, so when glutamate gets released, it's normally present at the synapse for relatively short periods of time. Um, amyloid beta seems to interact with some of the, the transport mechanisms, may prevent glutamate from easily being removed. And so glutamate may start hitting some sites. And here I'm showing um, some receptors that may be not even present at the synapse. We call them extrasynaptic receptors, in particular a receptor called the NMDA receptor that when they're active, they can set up a cascade that leads the neuron to, uh, to die. And, and the major mechanism seems to be through uh, calcium overloading inside of the cell as a result of this activity. So we wanted to see whether these small drugs could interact with this system some way to prevent that neuronal death. So why this MGLUR4? Well, if you as you are interested in neuroscience, you know the basic structure of a synapse. You have an axon terminal up here, which is uh, filled with vesicles with neurotransmitter. You have a synaptic cleft. You've got a postsynaptic site here, shown as a dendritic spine with receptors. You have astrocytes, which are involved with regulating the, the responses of the neurotransmitter, usually be involved with uh, transport and uptake a lot, uh, very much so. And in this process, the part that we were interested in was this MGLUR4, which is actually a glutamate receptor that's found on the presynaptic membrane. So it's found on the axonal terminals. And when glutamate binds to it, it sets off a cascade which desensitizes the calcium ion channels, makes these calcium ion channels no longer sensitive to action potentials. And when that occurs, then when action potentials fire, there's going to be less neurotransmitter released. It's a auto-feedback inhibitory pathway. It helps prevent too much glutamate from, from coming in. And so our goal here is to look at some small molecules that won't prevent the first release of glutamate. But when the drug binds to this receptor in the presence of glutamate, it will enhance the inhibitory effect making it much, much, much le less likely for further neurotransmitter to be released. And so the idea is that we'll allow the initial messages to go forward, but then try to put a huge break on more glutamate being released and therefore potentially more glutamate available for toxicity. So here's an example of the research. This is, a, this is actually an experiment that Lindsay did. And she worked with these 14-day-old primary neural cultures. Um, she stimulated them, in this case, just for 24 hours with a small amount of the agonist for that class of NMDA receptors, that glutamate receptor, that we think may be leading to the neuronal death. Previous research has shown that a concentration here is 50 micromolar. Um, this here, the y-axis, is the percent cell survival from our MTS assay. Control is going to be set at 100%. And then with just the NMDA, with none of our drug treatment, we see over the course of about, about 24 hours, about a loss of about a third of the neurons. Um, that's significant, and that indicates that, that this was stressing and, and trying to, it was creating 
an activity there that's making the cells more sensitive to the glutamate that's present and therefore leading to cell death coming on. So now with that, we applied varying concentrations of one of the compounds, and this was the compound RD82, RD standing for Rondal. Um, 82 is the, is the 82nd compound they made. And we found that um, at um, 20 micromolars that we saw significant improvement in the cell survival. It was interesting that that variability of survival was actually not just protected the cells from the NMDA, but it actually enhanced the survival over control. Um, so during our control cells, when they're 14 days old, they're releasing lots of glutamate. Um, and we think that during that time period, there's a lot of cell death that could be going on. And so what we suspect is happening here is that we've got um, some protection of the cells um, from that, which then might lead to uh, better conditions. So that's an example of one of the projects that we've been working on. Another project I was working on with uh, two of my students, uh, this is uh, Karina and Charlene, uh, was with the drug Methylene Blue. Um, Methylene Blue was recently in a phase three drug trial for AD that failed. Um, at the time that they started this project, the, the trial was ongoing, so we didn't know it was going to fail. But, but we, uh, we were interested because the, um, the people who were doing it thought that this drug, um, this dye, could act as an anti-tau aggregation drug. It could prevent tau from aggregating and potentially forming the tangles in Alzheimer's disease. However, there are some other research that suggested that if it's doing something, it's going to be doing it based on the fact that it's a, um, um, could boost mitochondrial function and help produce more ATP and thereby maybe create more energy for the cells to thrive under toxic conditions. So we tried to ascertain what kind of mechanism might be going on. So was tau working or was methylene blue going to work by increasing ATP, maybe decreasing reactive oxygen species, or was it going to work somehow to be involved with preventing tau from aggregating? We couldn't do too much with the tau right off the bat, but we had this idea that tau is expressed in growing axons and it's fairly highly phosphorylated. And if this was aggregating under these conditions, maybe the axons would not grow so well. Whereas if there's a lot of energy, a lot of ATP, maybe the axons would grow well. So Prina came up with this idea of tracing the axons link. So after just simply a day in culture, she fixed the cells and just drew with her computer, um, um, with a program and just looked at the lengths of each of the individual axons. And when she saw there was a variety of lengths and then she tested whether this methylene blue would affect either making them shorter or longer. The biggest takeaway from when you look at this data, and this is simply the, uh, the y-axis, the axonal length, how long the axons are after a day, um, versus the different concentrations, so zero, no methylene blue, 50 nanomolar, 100 nanomolar, and 200 nanomolar. Uh, no statistical differences here. I mean, numerically, 100 was higher than the others, but statistics didn't show that there was a difference. And Actually, the thing that I, you notice most about this data set, and the reason I included it here, is that the error bars are really high. But don't think of them as error bars. Think of them instead as the variation of individual neurons being in different states, some growing short axons, some growing much longer axons. And with that in mind, we just decided to take a look at the data with a different perspective. And so instead, we just took a look at two conditions here, the control and the, the best condition we had, the 100 nanomolar condition. And we looked at the percent of the neurons that had axons less than 50 microns. So they were really short versus those that were really long, which after a day was over 150 microns. And what we saw was that the methylene blue decreased the percentage of cells that were, had really short axons and more than doubled the percentage of neurons with really long axons. And so we hypothesize maybe that some cells are responding with this, if it's producing more energy, more ATP, if they have the capability, the right signals that may drive greater outgrowth. And so now we're looking to combine this drug with maybe another drug that might shift neurons more to that state of cell growth and use that as a way to try to ascertain what's happening here. The last project I want to talk about briefly is uh, one where I worked with uh, three different students, uh, Robert, Pearl, and John. Um, we used a drug called DCPLA it's, um, and tried to find out whether it could potentially help in Alzheimer's disease. 
It's a specific activator of a kinase, a protein kinase epsilon. And previous research from other labs have suggested that there's some positive potential effects of PKC epsilon for an anti-Alzheimer's disease target. What the drug does is it helps activate it by bringing it closer to the membrane. It's a, one of those kinases that needs to interact with the membrane to show good activity. And so this molecule helps pull that kinase up into the membrane and have that good, strong act activity. And some downstream consequences, could it protect against oxidative stress? Um, maybe in some people's hands, it seemed to protect against cognitive deficits in age in Alzheimer's transgenic mice. And then finally, um, the evidence that this might be a good target is the overall levels of this kinase have been reduced in Alzheimer's brains. And so if we can boost the remaining protein kinase C epsilon, maybe we'd have chances to get success. So working with a animal system, we decided to uh, uh, do this where we would uh, implant a, um, this little pump, an osmotic pump into uh, the ventricle. And when we did so, we were gonna pump in a solution that include amyloid beta and various agents that would cause oxidative stress. And then we did it with and without this particular drug, DCPLA. Here I'll show you uh, one of the assays where we tested their memory and we did so by doing a Morris water maze. So in this particular test, we put uh, the mouse into uh, this pool, actually it's a little kiddie pool. The water in our pool would be opaque, so it can't really see. And around the pool would be various visual icons that the, that the, the rat could see and observe and maybe help guide it to a particular location. And at first it would be swimming around and it soon it'd find that there was a hidden platform in one of the quadrants of the pool. And so eventually it got to the point where you'd put it in the pool and it'd swim right to the platform. Well, afterwards, then we would look and see whether or not, you know, A, how, how uh, much could we remember going to that platform? And then B, if we took away the platform, how would search strategies change? Would it stay looking for the platform there or not? And just sort of this idea of looking at spatial memory. And so this is an example of one of the data sets that we took from this research. Um, in this research, we are on the y-axis, you see the, the latency or the time it takes for it to swim to the platform, right? On day one, you know, it takes them a really long time. And by day five of training, you know, they're getting much better at finding the platform. But here's four different conditions, the control, the drug, and then the Alzheimer's disease conditions, the amyloid beta with the drug, all show the same level of learning during this five-day period. The condition where the stressor with just the, the FAB solution that we have that um, simulates the amyloid beta with oxidative stressors starts off with slower finding that the platform it struggles more at the beginning and then levels off and doesn't even seem to reach the same level of um, learning that we see in the animals that have found us. Afterwards, when we've taken out the platform, we demonstrated that, uh, that they have trouble remembering the FAB treated conditions, but DCPLA seems, DCPLA seems to prevent that particular decline in learning. Okay, so there in a nutshell is an example of three different projects I've worked on with my students. I would be happy to answer questions, whether through chat or whether through just throwing out verbiage, but however you guys want to do it, it's fine with me. Um, but do you guys have any questions for me on either the projects or with, um, what's, I described that, do you and Chris still talk today? Yes, yes, yes. I talked to him just, just this last week and, and uh, he's, he's handling his, uh, the COVID-19 as well as many of us can um, he does he, he does work in um, media and communication so he, he makes videos and, and, and does uh, virtual work um, so he, he's very good with this technology stuff much better than I am uh, but, but but yeah he, 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 we've been lifelong friends um, hello yes you can hear me yes I can so it was an amazing presentation. Firstly, thank you. Uh, so, you know, it, I felt that it was kind of insightful in the sense. 
so i am interested in uh, working with depression and uh, a lot of things in uh, alzheimers and depression seem to be uh, kind of similar like glutamate induced toxicity has been found to be there in depression too so i just feel that it was kind of insightful to see how it can affect both the diseases in certain ways you you, you raise a really good point and i just want to um make mention that um sometimes at various stages of of understanding the disease and the disease mechanism you have to <laughs> make choices about what kind of research that you want to get at to so so the people can come up with great ideas you guys i'm sure came up with tons of great ideas this weekend um what you got to have to do is come up with testable ideas and so that those are always the issues that people run into which is how do you think of you know there's 20 different ideas that you have about what you want to study and what you, why you want to look at it and then you have to think of of the things that are out there how can i think of the resources that i have available and with those resources can i do something and it may not be working with people who are depressed or with bipolar or with other conditions that you might be interested in but you can look for ah there's a pathway here that was identified here's an example of individuals that may have this or here was a animal model where they demonstrated something where they showed anxiety or de- depressive activity because of this particular function right and then try to look and understand what's going on and as you start delving into those mechanisms other things will just start popping up and it's from those things that then you will then drive a lot of the research questions that you have thank you you're welcome this question so what keeps you going on even after failing results from research yeah so so most of the research i've done has failed right and most of, most of my students when they've done their research um the data has not demonstrated the success of a hypothesis or has come up with with something that hasn't gone on i there's a story that i i, I didn't tell you about which was one that we were excited about this um this um protein bdnf and that we thought the potential could be there for for alzheimer's disease in our in our hands it just wasn't working and so we had to think about why that was and try to come up with some other ideas for me what keeps me going on the most is actually the students so <laughs> i get motivated by them they're always with energy so when you go to meet with faculty with professors what are the qualities that they'll look at and say that's the person that i want test scores now right how well you do on you know standardized testing will never come up um general understanding of the background material the, the pi knows that what they're really looking for is someone with energy with interest with drive and then the other qualities that i find that are most likely things that lead to really successful scientists are people who are organized right who are very careful with how they are doing things and how they're recording their information and presenting it very effectively also and i know this is from a strange thing to say but the kind of intellectual honesty you know when so things aren't working well understand why that is and and be okay to admit you know this line of research is not working let's think about something else that we might want to do and so those are things that are really helpful uh, when you're thinking about the next stage Oh, we have All right. So so I'm I'm going to type in my email to the yeah. chat. Um so yeah. for those that would like to um reach out to me, you know, at any time, I'd be more than happy to do so. Um just um when you do, just so I don't I pay attention to the email, if, you know, sometimes I'm sorry for them. Uh just just on the the subject matter, just, you know, you know, type in the conference uh, title and say, hey, you know, I heard your, your keynote speaker um talk and then I would um I would um make sure that I I I respond effectively to that but but yeah no um the other thing is is you know some of you again are in the stage where you're um you know looking to consider you know the next stage of, of where you want to either get schooling or doing research or wherever you want to go um as i told you my path was different than others right i didn't follow the same path and 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 you don't have to you know if someone tells you this is where to go or what to do 
you know, take advantage of your brainstem, right? I always say, you know, because people always say, follow your gut. <sighs> no, you're not following your gut. You're following your brainstem, right? So follow your brainstem, right? Look, get that reaction, right? Is this, is this the place that I'm going to be successful, where I'm going to grow, where I'm going to be able to do things, right? The name, the resource, all that is less consequential, right? More than what you do with it. Um, which is kind of what I was also trying to tell with the story that I did, right? You know, so I, I, I didn't have the same background. When I was my first semester at Harvard in the PhD program in neuroscience, I did not understand practically anything from the first series of lectures I heard. I would be, I'd be there, it'd be like le learning a foreign language because I'd never been in biology class. I, I learned biology while I was doing my army exercises, you know, in the Folter Gap in, in West Germany. I was like doing, um, you know, that understanding, but I, I never really heard it. And so one of the things I found was that by, by immersing yourself into it, it's like learning a foreign language. And it was like a couple months before the light really started turning on, I really started getting, you know, what was being said and why it was being said and what the purpose behind it was. So don't be afraid. My other point is don't be afraid to be like, I don't get it, because that's okay too. It's okay to be in a situation where you're not understanding everything, but you're going to be available. And as it comes in over and over again, it takes time, but it'll, it'll, it'll show up for you. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions for Dr. Noel? Okay. Seeing them, thank you so much, Dr. Null, for this very inspiring talk. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, good. Super. Great. And, and thank you so much for inviting me. That, that, was, that, that was a pleasure. It really was. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Null. That was actually incredible. Can we get a virtual round of applause in the chat? <laughs> you yourself. That was incredible. So we're just... Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. Feel free to leave the reaction. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving our keynote speech today. I see a lot of of applause in the Zoom, which is incredible. That was actually very different from a typical lecture, like what we would normally expect. So that was wonderful. Thank you for sharing your story and about your research. So next up, we will be moving on to the awards portion of our ceremony. Thank you again, Dr. Knowles, for that incredible talk. And we're going to be getting to the part that you have been waiting for throughout the course of this competition. So the first awards that we will be presenting is for the 13 to 17 age category, first and second place. So first place will receive a Texas Instruments CI-84 calculator. Each, each team member will receive this in the mail with a physical certificate of achievement and they will receive $50 to be divided among members, along with $25 coupon for the Art of Problem Solving's products and automatic acceptance into the Junior Academy of the New York Academy of Sciences, which has an approximate 10% acceptance rate. And second place will receive as well a calculator, a physical certificate of achievement, and also automatic acceptance into the Junior Academy. So could we have a drum roll, please, for our 13 to 17 winners in the second place? I believe Aravind will be playing a drum roll so we can kind of simulate the fact of an actual award ceremony. Aravind, are you able to get the drum roll up and working or, uh, or else I'll just play it. Drum roll in the chat. I don't hear anything from Aravind. Are we just not going to have a drum roll? It's okay. <laughs> Can someone just like beatbox and like call it a drum roll? Can we act? <laughs> Scott, like, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. You, Athena, you can do it. <laughs> Athena, bring out your inner talent. I can't, <laughs> can't hear the drum roll. That's sad. Okay. okay, that's fine. Can I just like drum roll on like the table? Okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> and second place is Imperial for demystifying finance and tackling the economics of the money illusion. They had an incredible presentation and a really well thought out solution complete with an app. So congratulations to Hala, Wyatt and Sophia. Next up in first place, drum roll please. <laughs> so bad. 
We have Team Deepfake, or Shallow Reelers, from Hannah Choi, Arin Han, and Jinny Kim. Congratulations. They had a really incredible presentation describing deepfakes, which are commu computer simulated images that are fake and have been used for malicious intent in the past. So they had a really incredible presentation on the topic of ethics. Next up, we will be announcing our 18 to 22 first and second place winning teams. So first place will be receiving a TI Inspire CX student software license, along with $50 to be divided equally among members, a physical certificate of achievement, and one year of student membership to the New York Academy of Sciences, which entitles them to free or discounts of 50% or more on many different programs, symposia, conferences, career development resources, access to many opportunities for resume building and networking, along with digital access to Academy publications and an opportunity to connect with other members through the global member directory. And second place will receive a, that actually should be the TI Inspire soft student software along with a physical certificate of achievement and automatic acceptance as a student member. So we're going to get our drum roll for 18 to 22 winners coming in second place. I'm sorry, I can't drum roll. <laughs> All right. In place is Team Nourishment, Alexis Nguyen, Faith Chadwick, Zainab Hussein, and Shruti Atreya. Incredible. They found a way to help improve different aspects of people's lives through ensuring that they are nourished properly and are really able to have their brain in the best state as it can be. So congratulations. Next, second place, uh, first place in the 18 to 22 age category. Cheers. Nika Kashyap, Andre Mitrofan, and Chalene Nguyen. They, had, they came up with a statute for physician engagement and accurately reassessing status, which was their proposal for a piece of legislation complete with a lot of incredible briefings and different resources that would actually be able to get such an act in action. So congratulations to our first place team of the 18 to 22 category. Right. Next up are the awards for the best in category teams, one from each category. So we have ethics, engineering, neuroeconomics, healthcare slash public health and research. And they will receive a physical certificate of achievement and simply neuroscience swag in this form of stickers in the mail. And addition to either New York Academy of Sciences Junior Academy membership or a student membership for those who are 18 to 22. Additionally, anybody who has received who has submitted a project by the deadline. So including if you don't win an award today, you will receive a digital certificate of recognition after the competition. So first off, I believe our first category is engineering. So can we get a drum roll for our awards? Engineering, Nervo Sensor. It's Ganguly, Vanessa Rigoglioso, and Garanti Yadav. Congratulations. You guys did an incredible job complete with creating designs for wearable technology for helping to sense when a panic attack will occur and helping to prevent it, which is an incredibly important piece of engineering work for today's society. Right, after that, we have the engineering category. So we're going to have a drum roll for the, for the, did I say engineering? I meant ethics for the ethics category. So let's get a drum roll for the ethics category. The third verdict, they had an, yeah. They had a really thought out presentation for their ethics topic on, I believe, neurocriminology. And it was just an incredible presentation that was really very feasible compared to other projects that we've seen. So that really stood out to us. So congratulations again to the team of the third verdict. All right, our next category, I believe is healthcare in order. Okay, so for our healthcare category, we're gonna have a drum roll. My drum roll getting better, I don't know. Uh, SDU. Thank you and Joseph Sexton. Congratulations to Maggie and Joseph. They had a really well thought out presentation for healthcare and public health and 
This was focusing on science and policy for suicide prevention. And they really provided very thoughtful um, policies that could actually be implemented to help prevent suicide, including with access to firearms and that sort, which is incredibly relevant to today's society. So congratulations to Maggie and Joseph. Next up, we have neuroeconomics, I believe. So a drum roll for neuroeconomics. Low risk, high reward. Uh, Tiffany Mark and Trey Mayta. Yeah, so Team Low Risk High Reward had a really interesting exploration into gambling and proposed a means of helping people who are looking to stop gambling to help them stop getting addicted through the usage of an app as well as other intervention techniques that was really inspiring to learn about. So congratulations to Team Low Risk High Reward. And our final presentations from the research category, best in research, we'll have a drum roll. Team Shake It Off. Via Venkatraman, Bhuvi Kedia, Cassandra Schroeder, and Isabella Barrera. So Team Shake It Off had an incredibly detailed research proposal to help determine means of fighting Alzheimer's, I mean, Parkinson's disease which was incredible. I also loved their team name, by the way, with Parkinson's. Yeah, so congratulations to Team Shake It Off. And that concludes all of our award presentations. So again, congratulations to all of our awardees. And we will be asking that awardees stay after the meeting to receive some additional information. So um, with that, I hope that you guys had an incredible time in terms of next steps. So regardless of whether or not you won an award, you will be receiving a digital participation certificate via email. So be sure to fill out our feedback form, which one of our organizers can send in the chat. So this is just going to provide feedback on our competition and also allow us to get your email and phone name so that we can send you a certificate for participating if your team submitted their project on time. And in terms of I know a lot of people wanted to get their rubrics back. So if you want to see your team scores and judge feedback and comments, you can fill out the second form that Brian sent out. So if your team has been chosen as a winner, of course, please stay in the Zoom meeting after the closing ceremony to attend our winners meeting. It should be a, a very quick meeting, five to 10 minutes long, and also fill out the winners form that we will be sending afterwards. So with that, we will be wrapping up our International Youth Brainstem Summit closing ceremony. And we really hope that you enjoyed the weekend full of inspiration, enrichment, and innovation. And it was incredible seeing you at our workshops and speaker sessions. And of course, thank you so much to our speakers and workshop hosts. I know some of our organizers, if you guys want to have any last remarks, you can feel free to unmute yourself and provide those remarks. Yeah, thank you all for attending the International Youth Brainstorm Summit. When we first organized this a few weeks ago, we weren't sure how it would go. It was quite um, quickly organized, and we weren't sure how the attendees would be able to do all their projects in such a short time frame, how the judging would go, and how the workshops would take place. But ultimately, with the help of all of our organizers, all of the judges, and of course, all of you, the participants, we were able to pull it off. And it was definitely one of the best experiences I've had uh, organizing any event um, ever. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, and we hope you enjoyed the International Youth Brainstorm Summit. Yeah, thank you so much to our 600 plus participants from 42 different countries. I'm still reeling at everything. No, Brian can provide some additional remarks. Yeah, certainly. I completely agree with Arvind and really want to thank the judges as well as the participants and fellow organizers once again for just putting this event together and really making it something fantastic and it seems like there's a lot of po positive response from the competitors so we really hope that you enjoyed your time in this competition. I have one thing to add. Um, I know a lot of you guys were thinking about really cool projects, things that you can do in real life. So even though the competition itself is ending, you should not feel limited to like the time of this competition itself. Like keep chatting, get each other's contact information, join the slacks, keep working on these things. And you guys can do some really awesome things with all the ideas you discussed.
Yeah, for sure. We were talking to our judges afterwards, and they were really talking about how advanced you guys are, especially at such a young age. I know Dr. Knowles touched upon it as well for really your exploration of neuroscience. And now we have another remark from Skylar. Yeah, so I think we should just give this last round of hype to the organizers, you know, Kayla, Athena, Aravin, Brian, I know you guys work endlessly, like day and night, just always like chatting in the Slack. And, you know, there was never one day like where you weren't just like grinding. So if everyone can thank like the organizers and also you guys, because without this um, whole group of students who are just curious to learn more about neuroscience and, you know, just innovate and everything, this whole competition would have been brought to life. So, you know, thank you to everyone. Thank you to the judges, the participants, the winners, the organizers, the workshop hosts, like everyone involved. Um, I just really appreciative of. And, you know, this has just been an amazing experience because I've really never organized an event before. So, you know, outstanding job as everyone has been saying. And I really hope that you take all of the skills that you've attained from this competition to, you know, maybe some future projects and beyond. So, you know, this doesn't end here. The journey doesn't end here. Just keep on using neuroscience to innovate and impact the world. Yeah, for sure. I think that really wraps it up. Thank you so much, Scholar, for that. And with that, we'll be closing, sadly. It's really sad to see you all go, but I hope you had an incredible experience. And with that, please, if you're a winner, so you can stay after as everybody leaves the Zoom meeting. And we'll be sending out the links again if you weren't unable to access the form. So thank you so much. And yes, of course, don't forget to drop your LinkedIn profiles or any other social media profiles that you would like to share. That could probably be in introductions or even general so that you can connect with other participants. So we'll play some exit music as everybody else leaves. And thank you so much for attending. So thank we'll you. See you guys. Bye. Bye, everyone.